When you start a new business or you want to scale up, speed is important. With the right network and people who know what you are doing, you gain velocity. You can learn from other SaaS companies about their successes, but also about their mistakes so that you can avoid them yourself. Welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show. Kaya, how's it going? Doing great, Alex. Happy to connect. Super happy to be in the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to, great to have you here. I understand you're, you're tuning in from or you're sitting in a Costa Rica right now. So perhaps making uh, some of our listeners who are in colder climates feel a little <laughs> bit uh, envious. How comes, uh, how comes you're in Costa Rica? Oh, so we've, uh, well, I'm, I'm originally Costa Rican. And then we, we, when we started the company, we understood that we had to be a U.S. company. So we, you know, we established an office in New York, and that's where we consider our headquarters to be. But we've always kept the team in Costa Rica, and some stuff just ends up being cheaper and more effective to have out here. I still spend about two-thirds of my time in Costa Rica because it's nicer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, uh, get to Costa Rica, uh, or do you say Costa Rica, um, at, uh, at, at some point, but uh, it's definitely on my, on my list. Uh, funnily enough, or, or not, but I've been following this guy, Paul Saladino, who's the, the, the carnivore MD, sort of recently. And, uh, I just did a 30-day animal-based diet challenge, and, and he's American but lives in Costa Rica, and uh, all his Instagram posts look very idyllic. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining uh, you, you've got some uh, idyllic surroundings uh, as well. But uh, we do, we do. I mean, I'm not sure if you know, you, you know the guy, but uh, or do animal based. But uh, yeah, very uh, very interesting. But we're not here to talk about you know diets uh, as such. I want to get to know a bit more about you. You know the business that you've built, and you know some of the great marketing that you've been doing as well. So let, let's start with you. You know, uh, who is Kaya? And yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, as a person and then as a founder. So, yeah, I sort of stumbled upon a lot of what I do. It's not that I, you know, and, and I like to think that this is a, is a nice kind of origin story in the sense that I, I think that great companies don't get started because somebody figures like, hey, I want to start a company and they start finding an idea. But it's more like, you know, whatever they were doing at the time made them stumble upon this problem. And then they certainly kind of were positioned to solve it. You know, a short story of mine and into how I found this problem. I started my first company back in 2011. And I was, you know, I had no idea that I, what I was doing was starting a startup. This was this world of, of startups was completely unbeknownst to me. I was unfamiliar with it. I'm from Costa Rica. <laughs> So uh, we, a friend of mine, you know, a friend of mine and, and me, we got together. We wanted to build this iOS gaming platform, and we figured we would put the project on Kickstarter because we we, ha we had heard about that. And suddenly, TechCrunch picked it up. We had not heard of TechCrunch before, and suddenly we were just getting bombarded by investors saying, "Hey, are you guys raising money? What's the size of your round?" You know, I want I want to invest, and we're like, "Well, is this a scam? Or are you trying to is, like what's what's going on here?" So. It it was I was it was a complete crash course for me over the next few months, kind of understanding and living in this world. We we got accepted into this accelerator in New York, which was very transformative in, in a lot of ways, but it was kind of part of this crash course. So that company went out of business, long story short. But the 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 problem that I found was, well, a lot of people want to move into the into you know our our starting companies and don't don't understand or have no idea how fundraising works, how how doing a pitch deck works. You know, I was sitting next to all these other CEOs that I looked up to because they were kind of from New York and they, you know, they had, they were, it was not their first company and they were still in this accelerator program and they were still struggling to tell good stories about their companies on their pitch decks. They were still struggling to figure out their financial models. So it, it's like, I think all founders, regardless of experience, kind of struggle with that a little bit. So that kind of sparked the idea for, for Slidebean. You know, I, I, I saw that company to its end. It died, but as, as soon as that was over, yeah, you know, I quickly figured out that well, you know, maybe I'll start a company that that helps first on the presentation side. Like that was the first problem that we identified. But what if we start a company that helps companies tell better stories about their about what they do and and design better slides to tell those stories? Awesome. Uh, and, and so that I guess 
and I definitely relate to that. Like, I mean, in terms of what I'm doing now, uh, I'm sure many can listen. You know, I, I stumbled into it. There was no kind of like grand design, you know, kind of like big idea that I, that I thought, okay, I'm going to start this business. And it, it just kind of, you know, evolved naturally. And then great to see in terms of what you're doing with Slidebean and, you know, agree to like helping startups and founders, you, you know, create better pitch decks and tell, tell better stories. So you, 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 you came up with this idea, you know, decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, run this business. What were the next steps? How did you form the company? You know, do you have co-founders? You know, what what, what was that kind of, you know, what, what did these kind of first few months kind of look like? Uh, and, and you know, what were some of the, the ch- challenges and successes there? They, they were, they were shitty and at the same time, fundamental, right? So the, no money. I, I got together with two two other co-founders. One of them was a good friend of mine from from high school. So I had known I don't known well, I've known Vinny for fifteen years or something more probably. And then Jose, who was our who was our CTO, we sort of recruited him, and which which we got lucky recruiting technical co-founders is is really hard. But the secret or the essence there is you know you have to you know the idea needs to be good. You know the tech co-founder needs to come in, not as an employee. Uh, not as hey, like I'm hiring you to build my idea, but on the other hand, I'm hiring you to. No, I'm sorry, I'm not hiring you. You're coming in as a co-founder because we believe in your expertise, and we're going to listen to you, and you're going to have a say in what's happening. And a lot of people get that wrong, but we got lucky again, and, and we got that right. Started working on this. We did a little consulting on the side so that we could pay the bills, but essentially started working on building the first product. We relied a little bit on grants and funds all over the world. So we did, uh, there's this program called Startup Chile, which gives you about 35K equity free, which is which is very, so we we actually moved to Chile. You know, I think the most important part of that experience was for them who are also new to the startup world, getting to connect with this community, but also for us as a team, the, the, the bonding, because we shared an apartment, right? So we lived together for six months as we were, as we were part of this. That, I think that that was absolutely key to anything that came afterwards because you know it's i think that you know the relationship that you have with your co-founders is a bit like a marriage but you know without the fun stuff it's just like it's like a marriage with money issues and with very tough conversations and with and with tension and and worry and gray hair about what what's going to happen to the company so you need to deal with that i i think as friends beyond just the, the the professional side yeah, and and you know, it took us about you know we were very lean about it. We launched a very very simple product. It took us about three months, three four months to launch the simplest of things, just to see how people reacted to that. Yeah, I guess that is the origin story. And uh, are you bootstrapped or, or venture backed? Yeah, so we raised some so we raised some venture money a few much longer. Everything's been much, or at least for us, it was much slower than we expected. It took us about a year a year and a few months to raise the first check of venture money. But we did. Yes, yeah, so we raised the we raised the seed round across a bunch of different investors and across a bunch of months, but in the end ended up being about about a million dollars as a seed. You know, what other data can you share, you know, about the company where you are sort of at now, like in terms of headcounts and um, yeah. you know, any other metrics you can share. Yeah. So we, you know, the long story short is, you know, we raised that seed round. We used it to fuel growth and and for a little bit for a couple of years, we were sort of on that startup path, which is the, the venture backable startup path. And, and a lot of people think they are on that path, but they're they're not. You know, that that's a path of growing three times year on year. And we and it's it's almost like it's like a it's like a bit of a dream, right? You look at you wake up on your metrics and you suddenly grew up 10% by the end of the month. And that's that's super crazy. And everything moves really fast. So we were sort of on that road for for a few months, actually a few years. You know, and then and then you know, getting into some SaaS metrics, we had a, we had a churn problem. Uh, so churn came to bite us in the ass. We were we were super efficient, and we we got again lucky, I think, with marketing. So we were great at bringing customers. You know, we it, it came to a point where we were adding 13k in MRR monthly, which which was, you know, it, you know, it, it could put you on on a million dollars in ARR. You could add a million dollars in ARR in six months, right? But you know, as as the user scale, then that's that's when churn start, churn started to become a problem. So it, we we reached, I think, around a uh, million dollars in ARR ish, 
And at that point, we we found this balance where we were bringing about 13K worth of MRR every month, but we were losing about 13K of MRR every month. So we, we ignored churn for too long. And after that happened, we sort of had to re stop, regroup, and and rethink the product in you know honestly from scratch. And at that point, at that point, we were kind of preparing to raise a series A because we were running out of our seed money. Yeah. And we were at this point where we had this massive churn problem and absolutely not in a position to raise any more money. So the the only path forward that we saw was just, well, okay, we have we have to wait it out. We have to become profitable if we want to survive and solve this solve this churn problem. And you know, that kind of set us on this new path of it's it's a totally different business now when you don't have a lot of cash to spare and a lot of cash to burn uh things move slower you you have to worry about profit you have to be more diligent about everything but you know we we've been on that mode for the, for a few years now again it's it's another world where when when you're venture backed you know that there's a deadline there's a deadline maybe 12 months away where you either raise another round or run out of money at the pace that you're going and that keeps you up at night. It kept me up at night. Being profitable helps sleep better, but at the same time, is of course not as exciting, not as not as fast growth as you'd expect. But you know, we've 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 been regrouping in 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 that time, and and, and again, churn is is cancer for a company, and, and it does require you to rethink your product in a lot of ways, which is what we've been working on. Can you share in terms of how you've been going about fixing the the churn problem, and then that impact uh, on the business? Yep. Just to, just to provide a little bit of context, so our, our original product was just a presentation platform. We, yep. we you know, we we thought, I think naively, that you know, I'm sure you've heard of Pitch.com, which is this new fancy, sexy yep. presentation software. I think I think that we, in our heads, we wanted to build something like Pitch.com back in 2013. Yeah. And that that's what we set out to build. So the way we pitched it to investors is like this thing is going to kill PowerPoint. PowerPoint sucks. It's it's going to be acquired by one of those major players as a new way, a total new way to build presentations. I think that, you know, the, the way we approached it was we're going to separate content from design. We're going to let people just add the content, not worry, not even look into how the slide's going to look, just f figure out the content and then design the slides for them. That was kind of like our premise to, to our product. Yeah. Uh, the problem was that that premise worked, but it only worked for a, for a very specific presentation scenarios. Like if you had a salesperson that had a, an old deck that they wanted to make look better, and that's what sort of motivate them to find an alternative to PowerPoint, they want to have that deck brought into this new platform and look and have that deck look better. And our platform wasn't wasn't very efficient at that. We were efficient when you were starting a new presentation from scratch. We were we were great. I think we're still great at that, but we couldn't solve all these pain points of 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 presentation. And I think we were naive in that regard. So that was that was this sort of 1.0 product. So again, we were very efficient at growing it. We found an audience, and that audience was startups and pitch techs that that used it. That were willing, you know, pitch tech was is like a special presentation. You're trying to raise money with this presentation. You're willing to spend a little money on making that presentation look better. So we we found a niche. I would call this product market fit with our with our presentation product. The problem with with that premise was that you only need a pitch deck once, right? So you need, you're need you're fundraising over three, six months. And after that, you either raise money and then get into working in your business, or you don't raise money and you go out of business. So both of those cases translate into churn. So we'd get into this very sad um, review thing. When, when, when somebody canceled, we asked them, hey, why are you canceling? And the answer was like, I loved your product. Thanks to you guys, I raised money for my company, but... I don't need it anymore because I've raised money for my company. So that's you know, that's an inherent product problem. It's a product that, that this is a product that works. We found an audience, but it's it's flawed in 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 its business model. So you know, there's 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 there are a lot of stories from this process from going into just billing customers on a per presentation basis, which which didn't work out because you'd ha we'd have to chase customers every month. There's no more predictable revenue. We went into kind of being super premium with our pricing and saying, well, we're going to charge you a lot of money and then that's going to increase lifetime value. Yes, of course, but that increases also price sensitivity. Any any very little detail bug, if you're paying $200 a month for this thing, you're, it's unacceptable. So that's that's you know that created a lot of friction, bad reviews, bad NPS score. 
And then what went, what ended up happening was, you know, a little bit of hacks and a little bit of kind of lean startup and and just little r- random marketing campaigns. We found ourselves with this audience of hundreds of thousands, either through our blog one and through our YouTube channel two. You know, the YouTube channel gets over half a million views a month. Our website on SEO gets over three, 400,000 hits a month. We have this huge audience that found our, find our content useful, that, that find our expertise in this whole fundraising thing useful. And we've created a lot of content around it. Just, it's just, it's, they, the pitch stick is just one little part of that fundraising part. So what we did as a company is, well, what if we become a suite? What if we do more things for these users? What if not only we help them in other ways, but we also monetize them in other ways beyond just the pitch deck, which is just this very specific part of the process. And that is what we've been working on for the, for the past year or so. And you know, so far it's it's going well. I can't call victory just yet, but it is going much better yeah. than what we used to. Awesome. Well, can you share maybe then in terms like beyond then the pitch deck, you, you know, the, you mentioned this suite of things. What are the the products that you you bringing in here to kind of help the your your customers so you, you know what are the what are some of the things yeah so we we again this was a marketing hack we we released we, we've always been trying to be transparent so for example we released our financials our actual financial model um as a blank template but also we actually released our numbers for the early years of the company just so other founders could reference that random little blog post, you know, and, and we suddenly discovered that we were getting thousands, thousands of downloads of this financial model a month. So we're like, well, what if we sell this thing? And, and we start, we started building financial model templates. So that's the first thing we built a bunch of simple, but also advanced and very thorough financial models that let people estimate or early stage companies estimate what's going to happen with their round, with their money, with their growth. And now that's become a bit of a tool and a bit of a satellite tool to this. That's one. The other tool that we built as part of this was a little investor finder. So we figured, well, if you're doing a pitch deck, uh, you're trying to find investors and it's, you know, once you deplete your network and you connect with everybody that you know, you have to go out and, you know, and, and find we new investors, right? And that's a boring, tedious, angel list plus LinkedIn process, right? So what if we automate that? So that's, you know, we figured, well, what if we hack this product over a month and, and see what happens? So that's, that became our new investor finder. That extends to courses. We've, we've built, a, you know, as part of our content, we built a bunch of courses. We put some of those on Udemy and some of them on Skillshare. And we figured, well, what if we, we have these courses in-house? This is so, suddenly part of these tools. Probably the last big piece of that puzzle, which now it's close to a million dollar business for us, is a lot of these companies were coming to us and saying like, guys, I, I, I see your content. It's been super helpful. Please help me tell my company's story. And our immediate answer to that is like, yes, here's this SaaS tool that you can use. It's just $29 a month. You can just follow our pretty template and, and tell your company's story. And, and their reply was, no, no, no. Like, I want you guys to help me. And for the longest time, we just pushed them away because we didn't want to get into this consulting service services yeah. business. The same with design, like, hey, re- please redesign my presentation, or they would sign up for Slidebean for the presentation platform, and they'd be like, no, 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 like, I don't need it. I just need to redesign this one. How do I do that? I'm willing to pay you for, to do it. So we created a branch that we call Slidebean Agency, which is a consulting branch. So this, these are just a few examples of this, all this, yeah. these things that we've been created. Because when you're not a vent, when you don't have any any money to spare, any venture back money, you sort of have to. Take the money where it's coming from. Sort of listen to the users and pay attention to these things. Yep. No. No. I agree. And I mean, um, not not quite the same, but it, like, to, but to that point, you you know, for us, we you know, we've been a conference business since in, content and conference business since in, inception, and you, you know, then twenty twenty, you know, COVID kind of took away the ability to do physical conferences. And we, you know, we, uh, and I've spoken about it before, but, you know, we had a, a temporary moment where revenue went to zero, but, you know, had 24 people on the team. And then we had to look at, you, you know, obviously time to value for customers, fastest time to revenue, you, you know, and, and sometimes we would take, you, you know, just having to kind of take money, you know, where, where do the customers want to spend money with us? How can we help them and like create these kind of new things uh, and new products and a new online business and service that we didn't have before? And so actually with that, you know, over the last two years, we now have an online business as well as an offline business. We never had the online, you know, business before. 
you, you know, and, and we've had to do what is necessary to, you know, help the business kind of through the storm. And with that, you, you know, a lot of what we've developed and innovated, you know, has stayed and some of it hasn't, but, but yeah, you, you know, some being bootstrapped and not having, you, you know, like, you know, 10 million in the bank or something like that. You've kind of got to, you've got to do these things as a founder, right. To kind of, you know, keep it, keep it going and steer the ship through that. And, um, you mentioned like the your content, right? And like incredible stats around the traffic to the blog, SEO, and YouTube. And YouTube's how I think I, I stumbled across you, you know, as well, and your content there, which is great. And kind of, uh, I, I aspire us to step up a level, and you know, also have a, 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 a like, you know, get to the kind of quality of the stuff that you, you're putting out. It certainly looks, uh, you know, great from a production and really valuable stuff. So you, you have, I think, 330,000 subscribers on, on, on YouTube, there or thereabouts, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us a, like, all, all about this, right? So why did you decide to create a YouTube channel? You know, and what's the secret to success in getting this many subscribers as the first kind of two questions? So. Okay. So the first big breakthrough that we had as, as a company was when we found the, the key Google Ads keyword pitch deck. This was the first co coincidence, again, uh, pro of product market fit, like people coming from the keyword pitch tag would convert to our product, pay our product, use it regularly, churn out in, in a few months, but convert very well. So we went all out on this keyword on paid. And once we depleted that, and once we were kind of hitting all the searches that we wanted to, we figured, okay, well, that's only 5% of traffic that clicks on our ad. We need to be here on, on search, right? So we started this year hundred thousand dollar project to rank number one for the keyword pitch deck, which was a lot of content, a lot of marketing promotions to increase the website and SEO and optimizing and all of that. And we just rode that wave for, for two, three years as we grew in rankings, we grew in traffic and we, we saw that traffic come in again. The, the problem that our company was facing then was the churn was really, really high. And then we would get hundreds of customers a month. It, through these through these pitch decks, but we had these very leaky bucket that where we would lose uh, where we would lose them after that. But my focus during that time and the way we we've sort of split this with with my co-founders has been like they, they're both product uh, people, so they're you guys are on product, I'm on marketing and growth. So my my task was okay, we need we still we're not growing fast enough again because of churn. But the way I solved it in my head is like we need more traffic. What how do we get more traffic? So once we ran out of searches to target on, on Google search, it's like, well, what's the next search engine? Bing, I guess a little bit, but not really. The, the next, the second largest search engine is YouTube. Just people finding guides and instructions and tutorials. So we figured, okay, what if we start producing some YouTube content? Now YouTube has the problem of, and video as, as in general, has the very dangerous problem. Content marketing in general is has the challenge of being a slow marketing channel. If you're starting a business, you need results today. You need to find who your customers are today. You need to convert them today to study how they behave, how they convert, how they churn. And content marketing is, any way you slice it, is something that takes months, maybe years. So we slowly started to dip our toes into YouTube. Once we, this, I mean, by this time, we were a one, 1 1.5 million AR company. So we, we, we could spend a little time working on YouTube. Even, even though we, we had some cash, um, we were careful so, and, and we got lucky again, because we had hired a bunch of people that had a background in production that were not doing production work, but someone in marketing that had background in production, someone in our customer support team that, that had background in, in production. And when we figured out, Hey, like, why don't we do some experiment YouTube videos? They're like, Oh, I mean, I can take that as a little side task and see how, how that works. So we spent a couple of, you know, last piece of that puzzle. Like my background is really in digital animation, not in business or storytelling well, storytelling a little bit i guess it's it's a branch of film but yeah like all three of us almost a, in a hobby way it's like well why do we make these youtube videos and we spent you know we used to make one video a month try it we did the series making fun of like design topics but that didn't work out we made we made a sitcom of sort of like office startup situations that didn't really work out and we spent, but, but it was fun, right? So it was like this side project. And then we finally hit the nail on the head with this format, which is, you know, a 10 to 15 minute video presenting a, a startup related topic in a, you know, just everything that we know, through, essentially converting our blog posts, which we're doing well into a YouTube video with, with some better narration and some good animation in the background. 
people liked the production value. People enjoyed that. And that was kind of like our first successful video. So every moment through YouTube, we thought of YouTube as a direct response campaign. You know, whatever we spent producing this video, we need to recoup that with with conversions. And that was the first video that where the math and the economics worked. So we re sort of repeated that funnel, repeated that recipe for about a year. That grew us to around 30K subscribers. This, these are, these are search-targeted videos. Are people searching for pitch deck? Okay, let's make a video about that. Are people searching for convertible notes and how do those work? Let's make a video about that. We did one on investing, on, st on, on startup stock options, all these things that nobody, you know, that are complex to understand and that founders don't necessarily get well. We would make a good video explaining it. And, and that sort of created this audience of people that were learning from our content. So that was kind of like the first big breakthrough. The second one was, you know, just us kind of getting into this YouTube slash influencer mood and figuring out like, well, there's, there's something here. Like there's an audience, people are suddenly finding our brand. People are suddenly recognizing me on the street because they, they, they watch these content. It's been useful to their businesses. How do we make, but there, this is still a very niche thing. It's just very specific to the CEO of a venture backable company. So how do we expand from that? And that's when we came up with this series called Company Forensics, where, where we took the stories of failed startups and sort of digested why they failed. So you know some of them did really well because I think because of Schadenfreude, uh, Juicero, for example, if you remember, it was this like very random, expensive juice press that didn't really press juice. You know other larger stores like Boosted and how they how they went bust. So people. We started making like little documentaries around these stories, and that's when the channel blew up. So this broad content that you know anybody would anybody who owned a boosted board would care on how the company failed created this top of the funnel, and then anybody who was into entrepreneurship would move, would move to the second part of the funnel, which is the more specific, the more niche videos. And from there to our platform, it was just a very tiny step. Awesome. Well, I mean, congrats, congrats on that, and. What what has been like the impact then on on the business, like from you? Is it just, is, you mentioned obviously there's this awareness and people recognize you and they recognize, you know, the company and and so on. But is it driving, you, you know, I guess customers and converting customers and paying customers? Yeah. So there's a direct response part where, where that we measured, which was okay, people are coming from this video and converting. Great. We had I had never been a big fan of brand. I've always thought of the distribution of marketing efforts as 80% of money effort brain should go to direct response, stuff that you can measure, stuff that converts better, where you say, I'm pouring $10,000 here and and I know that I'm going to get those back. And then the, the remaining 20% is what I call brand awareness. That's most of social media, you know, an Instagram account is probably probably brand awareness, all of this stuff. We don't, there's, there's value, yes, in brand, it's intangible and you should spend a little bit of time on it, but not that much time. YouTube has sort of transformed my mindset here because at some point we just lost track of the direct response part and we just started getting the benefits or reaping the benefits of brand. The benefits of brand are people that convert better. Just they sign up, but they know they've heard about this product. Brand converts to people talking about this product and becoming evangelists because they love the brand more than the product itself. And they just, it's just in, the, in their top of mind. Brand translates into, into deals and partnerships, into, into being able to email people that you're more interested in and they, they sort of know or have heard of you. And, and of course, into, into revenue and conversions. In the end, this brand reach was probably the, la the last piece of the puzzle that convinced us that we had the audience to build more things for that audience, right? Because we would, you know, anything, any little experiment that we would launch, uh, any little tool or a little form or, or ebook that we would release and, and put on YouTube, tens of thousands of downloads, right? Or even purchases. So we figured, well, we can suddenly sell things to these people because they, you know, they trust us, they, they trust our brand. And again, a pitch deck is just a small part of all the things that they need to solve. This might, might be a leading question here because I'm going to have a guess what your answer might be. You know, what are, what are your thoughts on CEOs doing content marketing? Because I speak to, we, as you mentioned earlier, you know, it, it, it's not when you first start the business, it, you don't get instant results from, you know, it's a, it's a long game. 
And I speak with a lot of early stage, you know, SaaS founders and, you know, some are quite surprised about how uninvolved the CEO is in content marketing. They might have a content marketer or a marketing team, but often uninvolved. And then you see on the, the other scale, let's say, you know, folks like you and uh, I know Chris Walker uh, and, you know, some Patrick Campbell and, you know, folks like that, uh, that who are just like, you know, all about content marketing and kind of that figurehead of the company and building that brand. So, so like, yeah, what are your thoughts on CEOs in general doing content marketing? I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. You know, the big problem with our content marketing and, and I, the names you mentioned, I think, struggle with the same problem is mm. it's so associated to the CEO, to, to that face, to that mm. persona. So uh, what, what if the company gets sold? then you know and or if the ceo leaves or even even just time right the amount of time that i have to spend writing or or producing or supervising this content so that's the challenge in in our case there's in in our case the the just the reason why it requires my time is because you know i i like our audience is other ceos that are you know, for for the longest time, I thought that that were earlier than us in their in their journeys in their companies. We've I've found CEOs that are of much bigger companies that still watch our content, which I find incredible. But that's essentially it's like they they identify with this content because they they see the same struggles reflected in in me. So it's very hard to find somebody else to do that, unless they have a very very similar background. But you know, this we are an exception in that sense because our company just sells to other CEOs or other founders. But you know, depending on the business, say I don't know Squarespace or or a business that where the audience is much more broad, yeah, content marketing by all means is is a department within the company. How much time do you spend on content marketing? Are you, I mean, I you know you said you do marketing and and growth, but how much time would you say alongside the the other stuff that you need to do? Today, I'd say it's about half my time. Yeah, it's about half my time. Okay. And, and then, um, yeah, so looking to the future then, so the next 12, 24 months, you know, what are the plans for Slide Bean? And, you know, if you execute this correctly, you know, towards the, the, the vision, where, where do you hope you'll be? Yeah, the, the, the biggest change for us was this shift from presentation platform to a suite. That, that was a big product project, which releases in, in March. We're already testing the waters with this, and we're seeing we're seeing better conversions. We, you know, as part of our efforts to reduce churn on the presentation only product, we had to shift into annual only plans, which were great because it's it's cash up front. We saw good retention or good renewal rate for the second year because once people are hooked into the platform, they have a whole year to create some content. They don't want to cancel after that. So forcing people into an annual plan was was key to our to our survival. But but it's it's a very big barrier, right? It's a very big paywall. You know, the cheapest plan on annual is $96 a year. It's not that much money, but it hurts. As we've started to experiment with monthly, and we do A-B tests all the time, all, every, all the time we have A-B tests running, we're starting to A-B test the page against our new, this all-encompassing suite of tools plan for just $29 a month. And we've seen, you know, two to three X improvement in conversion rate. Just because the barrier is lower, just because the plan feels like a more, like a more holistic thing, we're seeing better churn than we used to see when we were back in monthly. So we're starting to see a little bit of that. And then again, of course, we had this thing that we didn't used to have, which is the brand. So the final question on my side is like, what what is the best advice that either you've received that you can give to those that are, that are listening? I mean, do not ever underestimate churn. It's it's absolutely key you know churn that's that's higher than 10 is business killing it's non-fundable investors are going to be thrown away by it and it's it's business killing and even though you're growing fast now when you know that balance of new mrr versus lost mrr will happen soon so that i think that that's the first one second one i'd say is like just understand that this journey the journey of starting a company is never a sprint it's 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 a marathon i he- i heard this and it sounded a little bit like bs to be honest like i heard this advice early on but it's it's so true you have to create a you have to enjoy it you have to 
in, uh, have fun working and you have to prepare yourself for a long run that will last for years, for five, seven, ten years. And if you're not ready for that, you know, you, you might be frustrated early, early on. So, or if you're just working too fast and burning yourself out, you're just not going to last the marathon. Yeah, no, great advice there. And often we see, I see it, well, I don't know about like every day, but often, um, you know, founders talking about is it 10 year overnight success sort of thing. So actually, you know, where, where they've got to, you, you know, hasn't been, you know, it doesn't happen in, you know, a year or so like that, you, you know, people don't see the hard years, the, the, the moments where they nearly died. And you obviously, you, you, you read about it in like books, like the hard thing about hard things. Um, but you know, there aren't huge amounts of, uh, you, you know, kind of like content, uh, like that, uh, kind of out there, but, but yeah, great, great advice. I'm like really, um, have enjoyed speaking with you and listening to you and, and, and you being like really transparent, open and honest and sharing, you know, with the, the, the SaaS stuff and the SaaS revolution audience, you know, uh, it, it's, it's been really great. I think uh, listening and learnings for for our audience, and uh, you, you know, we'll continue to watch on on YouTube as as you're killing it, and uh, hopefully we can get you to Dublin over to SaaS Talk in uh, in October. I think a few of your SaaS friends will will be there, uh, and I, I guess kind of like final thing, like where can people find you online? Obviously on the YouTube channel, the Slide Bean. Where else can they can they reach you? Yep, YouTube, Twitter. Just hit us up at slidebean.com. I think you can start a little journey of YouTube videos from either of those. Good stuff. Well, Kaya, thank you so much for, for taking out the time. Hope you have a great rest of the day in, uh, in Costa Rica. Well, so finish my day in, uh, in Ramsgate. But uh, really great speaking to you. And, and yeah, thanks so much for joining the SaaS Revolution Show. Awesome. Thanks for having me.